Scottish theologian Sinclair Ferguson said, it is God who gives us the spirit of worship, and it is what we know of God that produces the spirit of worship. We might say that worship is simply theology, doctrine, what we think about God, going into top gear. Instead of merely thinking about him, we tell him in prayer and praise and song how great and glorious we believe him to be. You know, in church, we transition, right? We go from singing to listening, from you actively participating, and then you passively receive. But today I want to talk about worship by saying it's all worship. To say that you can dissect certain parts of the service as offering and announcements and prayer and sermon, then you're dissecting worship because it's all worship. The people across the hall that are teaching our little ones right now, they do so as an act of worship. The team who serve on our board, they do so as an act of worship. When you are asked to teach or to serve or to lead or to sing, it's not just a call to ministry. It is also a call to worship. Worship is not just singing songs. In fact, I would argue that your worship is actually a reflection of what you believe about Jesus. Belief and worship, they go together. Belief should fuel worship. Right now, in our reading in the book of Matthew, the crowds, the religious leaders, the disciples, everyone, they are trying to figure out who Jesus is. The disciples have gone all in. They have pushed all their chips out on the table. The rest of the world, they are still trying to piece this story together. And last week we said that Jesus sat down to teach the crowds. He told a lot of stories and they were about scattering seeds. And let's just see if that story has gotten through to anyone. We pick it up in verse 53. It says, And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this uh, also the son of Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So it sounds like a big no, right? It sounds like people walked away and they were saying, Who does this guy think he is? I mean, first of all, the crowds do seem to recognize that he has authority because it says they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get these mighty works? But the crowds are still hard soil from Jesus' story. The Bible says they took offense and they did not believe. So Jesus walks away saying, tough crowd, tough crowd. And so at the end of chapter 13, that question still hangs out there. Where did this man get his wisdom? How can he do these mighty works? And then they try to dissect where he came from. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the son of Mary? Aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Don't we know all his sisters? Where did this man come from? So hopefully in Matthew 14, those answers are coming. The beginning starts with, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oath and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. So at the very beginning of chapter 14, we have a, like a side story about Herod. But within that story, there is still the rumor of who Jesus 
could be. And people were thinking, well, maybe it's John raised from the dead. And then Matthew, our author, says, well, I guess I need to go back and tell you what happened to John because he hadn't told that story yet. So again, this isn't chronological, what we're reading right here, this is a flashback. So for you and I, we need to understand what's going on. Like who are all these characters? Herod the Tetrarch. What is a Tetrarch? Well, it's a compound word, tetra, right? Tetra uh, means four. So Herod is a governor of one of four different provinces. So he is the governor of Galilee. This is a position that was given to him personally by Mark Antony. And so even though that Herod rules over the Jewish people, he is not in fact Hebrew. He is an Arab. So this is where it gets a little weird. One day, Herod stayed with his half brother, Philip, when he was visiting Rome. And while he was there, he fell in love with his brother's wife, Herodias, who was also the brother's niece. Herodias also fell in love with Herod. So she agreed to divorce her husband, he agreed to divorce his wife, and the two of them got married. So just to be clear, Herod married his sister-in-law, who was also technically his niece. And trust me, it's, it's after this story, you're probably saying, I, I never knew that. It's okay. Herod had approximately 10 wives. Two of them had the same name. He had many children. Readers and even historians, they're still confused uh, trying to keep up with Herod's family. Okay, we skip ahead. Herod and Herodias, they have a daughter, and her name is Salome. Salome grows up, and she marries her half-uncle Philip, which means she is now her mother's sister-in-law. And she is also her mother's aunt. So what does this crazy family have against John the Baptist? <laughs> well, as a prophet, he's not afraid to call sin out when he sees it. So he had publicly, publicly called out this wild family. He said that their family was incestual. So on her dad's birthday, Salome does a provocative and very sexual dance for her father and his drinking buddies like you do, right? Totally normal thing for uh, a family. And Herod says, you can have whatever you want. Actually, he probably says, you can have whatever you want. And she asks her mom, and her mom says, I want the, that prophet who's been talking uh, smack about us in the news and to the newspapers, I want him dead, and I want his head brought to me on a platter. Now, why do we put this story in here? Why is this story kind of interrupting? Why do we have this flashback? I mean, we'd already talked about John, moved off of John. We were on to Jesus. Why does the author go back? Well, because it's part of the question and the answer to who is Jesus. Remember, Jesus said of John back in Matthew 11, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So even though we have this flashback and we're saying it's a flashback to earlier in the story, Matthew says, no, 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 no. This is a flashback to a story in 1 Kings. The Old Testament Hebrew king, Ahab, he married Jezebel. And Jezebel was the daughter of the king of Sidon. Sidon worshipped Baal. Sidon worshipped Asherah. These are pagan gods. And it was the influence of these pagan gods that began to change Israel. And Elijah, as a prophet, he sees sin. He's going to call it out. So he calls out the false gods and he challenges Jezebel's gods to a duel on Mount Carmel, where he basically uh, poked fun at Jezebel's gods in a very shameful way and poked fun at their prophets. Jezebel was so angry, she threatened to kill Elijah for this shame because he publicly shamed her and she's the queen. Just like John, what do we see him doing here now with Herod and his wife? Same thing. So what's Matthew doing? Matthew is showing you a similar story and he's setting it all up so that he can tell you 
that you're the reader and you're going to now connect the dots, right? If the Old Testament prophesied that Elijah would come before the Messiah, and if John really is the embodiment of Elijah, then that would make Jesus to be who? Plus, think about what else Matthew was doing right here. He's showing you, right? He's introducing you to a character. He says, here is Herod, right? Herod is a guy who kills prophets. Hmm. Because what role is Herod going to play at the end of Matthew? He is instrumental in Jesus going to the cross. Next chapter, going on. Uh, going on in verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go to their villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, this story, famous story, right? famous story, is told in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew tells this story from a unique perspective. He's telling it from the perspective of the disciples. And the Bible begins this story by saying, Jesus is already tired, right? That's how it starts. Can you imagine being tired from working all day and then turning around and seeing 5,000 people who need to talk to you, who need your touch. In fact, look at how the chapter ends. If you go all the way down to the bottom of 14, it says, and when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the Gerasat. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes, people who are hurt and hungry, no matter where Jesus goes, the needy find him. Pastor John MacArthur said they were all thrill seekers who eagerly followed Jesus as their king because he could provide healing and free food. Yeah. And the disciples in this moment, they are not wrong. They are not wrong. And you can't fault them. They said, you know what? It's late. You're tired. We can't feed everybody. Just tell them to go home to their own towns. I mean, imagine the setting. The apostles are exhausted from their short-term mission trip that they were on. They just wanted to sit down for a few days and maybe have some rest and some refreshment, maybe have a couple of days alone with Jesus. How annoying for this crowd to be around. Couldn't the crowds just give them a, a couple of days off? Any one of us would have asked for a couple of days off. But how does Jesus respond? He responds with compassion. He is a man of compassion. Matthew tells us that Jesus welcomed them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he cured everyone who needed healing. Even though Jesus was also exhausted, he welcomed them. Jesus was not inconvenienced. He had a chance to minister, to tell people about the kingdom of God. Presbyterian minister Philip Ryken says the way Jesus welcomed these people reminds us that we can go to him at any time and he will listen to our cry for help. If you have a need, if you have a concern, you can go to Jesus. Jesus is available. He will always receive you. He will always help you because he is compassionate. Remember, Matthew told us that when Jesus looked out over the people, his heart broke for them. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But what is interesting in this story is the disciples have now watched Jesus heal. 
They have heard him preach. They received kingdom authority from Jesus when he sent them out so that they would do their own mission work. And now Jesus gives them a command, right? We have a command from Jesus. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Now in the original Greek, this is a command. Jesus is putting all the responsibility right back on the disciples. He says, you give them something to eat. The 12 had just come back from their own short-term mission trips, and they had seen God do powerful things in their own ministry. See, but now they're back in Jesus's presence, and so they start to go back to defaulting, to letting Jesus do everything, to letting Jesus be in the light. And Jesus had sent them and told them already. He said, you know what? When you go out and do your mission work, I don't want you to take any extra money. Don't even take any extra clothes because God will provide. And he wanted them to learn about God's provision. And of course they would have seen that. Of course they would have learned that. But they have forgotten it so fast. They said, we only have five loaves and two fish. Where are we going to go and buy food for all these people? See, but that was narrow thinking. That was such narrow thinking. They were, they were forgetting already that they are actually with the one who provides. They had seen Jesus speak to nature and nature obeyed. You know, every week, it seems like, every week I will tell my son to clean his room, right? I say, clean your room. And to him, it's an impossible job. He just shrugs his shoulders and starts to complain because he doesn't know where to start and the job looks insurmountable. He can't, he says he can't do it and he puts up a fight. But all he would have to do is remember all the past times I told him to clean his room and what had happened in those instances. Because in every time that I've asked him to clean his room, I've always come alongside him and helped him. And I always do more of the work. He doesn't have to be frustrated. He has to remember that I help, I provide help. He never does it on his own, but he forgets that. He looks at the mess and he's immediately defeated. The 12 disciples look out, they see 5,000 people, probably more, right? Probably more. And they say, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough money. They've forgotten. They have forgotten who they're with. Have you ever wondered um, why you? Why you, right? And we said this last week that there's 7 million people in Texas who don't walk with the Lord. 7 million people who aren't Christians. So why are you a Christian? I mean, what's so special about you? If I asked you to teach Sunday school, if I asked you to lead a Bible study in your home, if I asked you to serve on the board, you might say, why me? Why me? What's so special about me? Well, why not you? You say, well, well I'm, not, I'm not qualified to lead a Bible study. Guess what? <laughs> God is not limited by your inadequacies. In fact, I think God would rather use you because you are weaker. I think God would rather use you because you admittedly have faults because then God is able to put his glory on display even more. So it's after Jesus' compassion and his command that we see his provision, the provision of Jesus. Matthew notes in his gospel, those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. That means that they could have had as many as 25,000 people in attendance that day. Luke 9 says, Jesus said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did, and they sat down. So picture 12 disciples moving through the crowds and they're telling everybody, organize yourselves into groups of 50. <laughs> you have groups of 50 all sitting down as clumps. That means there would have been about 500 groups of 50. Well, the crowd does what they're told. They all sit down in the grass. And, and then taking five loaves and two fish, Jesus looks up to heaven and the Bible says, he says a blessing over them. And Jesus probably would have said the traditional Hebrew blessing for the breaking of bread. Blessed be you, O Lord, our God, King of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. And then Matthew said that Jesus broke the loaves 
and gave them to the disciples to give to the crowd. Now, the Greek word for gave is in the imperfect tense. Now, you could say, well, what does that mean? Well, it literally means kept giving. Kept giving. Which means the disciples each get a massive handful of loaves and fish, and they rush over to one of the groups of 50 that they're serving. They hand them all out, and then they rush back to Jesus, and he gives them more food. Every time they go back, Jesus gives them more. Think about the book of Genesis. This is a marvelous miracle of creation. It demonstrates the ability that God has to create something out of nothing. Jesus is able to create food out of nothing. But then you're also reminded of the book of Exodus. Like Moses, Jesus provides bread from heaven for the children of Israel. And then finally look at the sufficiency of Jesus. Matthew said in verse 20 that they all ate and were satisfied and what was left over was picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces, which means every person ate and ate until they were full and then there was plenty of food left over. In fact, there were 12 baskets of broken pieces left over. Exactly one basket for every disciple. What a wonderful, visual, very heavy reminder when you are worried about your inadequacies, Jesus is sufficient. Jesus meets our needs. He exceeds our needs. You know, there's a short poem that captures this truth. It says, yesterday, God helped me, and today he'll do the same. How long will this continue? Forever. Praise his name. So what's here for us to consider? Well, I think we need to remember that Jesus will provide for our needs because we tend to forget that sometimes. Jesus provides our daily bread. He provides our food, our clothing, our shelter. Jesus also provides things like friendship and love. But most importantly, Jesus provides opportunities for us to serve him and the resources for us to do so. Why? Because Jesus is our sufficiency. He is our provision. Jesus says in John 6, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He also says in verse 51, I am, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. We have one more story in Matthew 14, and it's right at the end, and I think it's the most important one. Verse 22 says, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get out of the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was long away from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they had got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. There's our answer. Right? There's our answer to the question. It's black and white, plain as day. The disciples shouted out, First, they say, it's a ghost, right? It's a ghost. In other words, what is that? <laughs> what, what is that? We don't know. And Jesus calls back, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. You read that sentence and you are whisked away back to the book of Exodus. 
Moses kneeling at the burning bush, and Moses says, Who will I say has sent me? And God says, I am has sent you. And in that moment, Peter understands. And he says, if it is you, right? He says, if it is you, then command me. He actually starts by saying, Lord. Right? He hears Jesus respond, and he doesn't miss a beat. And he says, Lord, Master, Father, God, if it is you, then command me. Command me, Lord, as you command the wind and the waves. Command me as you cast out demons with your touch. Command me to come to you. And Jesus says, come to me. And Peter steps out onto the waves and he lays his entire weight on belief. And as long as his eyes are on the authority, he can do anything. Peter is not sufficient to walk on water. You are not able to walk on water. It's not possible. It may be possible to feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish, but in no earthly way is it possible for a human being to walk on water. Peter does it because of Jesus, not because of who Peter is, because of who Jesus is. Matthew points out that Peter began to be afraid when he looked at the wind, and he began to seek, sink, and he cries out again, Lord, right? Master, God, Father, save me. And Jesus did. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Don't miss that point. Jesus' comment about Peter's small faith, that's not what made him sink. You can have a little bit of faith and still do impossible things. You can teach Sunday school with a little bit of faith. You can survive this trial that's going on in your life with a little bit of faith. You can lead a Bible study. You can share God with your family. It's not a measure of your faith that makes you sink. No, the things that get in our way, those things make us sink. Doubt makes us sink. Jesus says, why did you doubt? When Jesus had Peter step out of the boat, the object of his faith in that moment was Jesus. But he doubted. He said, I can't do this. And he was right. <laughs> How do you walk on water? You keep your eye on the authority. You keep your eye on Jesus. How can you feed 5,000 people with a few bread and a few fish? You keep your eyes on Jesus. How does Matthew close out this chapter? With the answer that we have been waiting for. Who is Jesus? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Ta-da! There it is. It's a huge billboard with flashing light bulbs. The Bible says those in the boat worshipped Jesus. And granted, what a moment. They had just witnessed something amazing. They had had an amazing day. I'm sure any of us would have done the same thing, responded the exact same way. But for how long? Because I mean, let's be honest, when God does something amazing in my life, or when Jesus provides for me, or he comforts me, or he comes through for me, he answers my prayer, he gets me out of a jam, be honest, my first reaction isn't always to worship him or to thank him. Instead, what often happens is I just start rationalizing things away and I say, I wonder how that happened. That was pretty lucky. That worked out. 
pretty good. Or another time, Jesus will step in and he'll, he'll fix something for me. But I'm too busy to even notice. He'll do something amazing, which is cool, but I'm already on to the next thing. And so it's like, huh, oh, thank, yeah, thanks, God, that was great. But um, can you do this now for me? But once again, in our story, when Jesus steps into the boat, we are told that they worshipped Jesus. They worshipped him. And this word worship means they would have physically gotten down on their knees. Their head would have touched the four, would, the, would have touched the planks of the wood in the boat as a way of showing reverence, as a way of showing awe, as a way of showing that they are fully surrendered to him. And no one told them to do it. They just automatically did it. After seeing everything that had happened that day, Jesus steps into the boat and they worship him. And in this moment, what they're really saying is, Jesus is God. He is holy. He is good. He is wonderful. He is truly awesome. And in that moment, I have to, I want to worship him. Have you ever had a moment like that with God before? Where he just so clearly showed up and he clearly just protected you from something or he provided for you and you just couldn't help it. You had to worship him. And you remember you felt like, oh, I'm, in, I'm in God's presence. This, all of this, what we do here at church, this is worship. It's all worship. I don't care about the pastor or the worship team or the volunteers or the board, whether I'm thanked or not, whether I have a lot of good friends here, whether I'm greeted, whether I get credit, who didn't greet me, whether I ever got my Tupperware back from the potluck, none of that is why we are here. We are here to worship him. Our first response should be to worship him. My hope and my prayer for this series is that we'd each, every last one of us, would just take a step out of the boat with whatever it is, Whatever God's put on your heart, we just take our step out and then we just, we just take another step and another step. And we keep our eyes focused on Jesus. You see, I know for myself, I don't want to live my life staying in and clinging to the boat. I want to live my life. And I don't want to play it safe. I don't want to just stay where I am. I want to step out. I want to trust Jesus. I want to be changed by Jesus. I want to step out and I want to be used by Jesus. I want to follow Jesus and I want to spend the rest of my life worshiping him. And so again, I hope and I pray that each one of us would step out. That includes me too. For myself personally, lately, I feel like God's challenging me to step out all over the place. I mean, to trust God with my kids. As a dad, I worry so much about them. And then weekly as a pastor, I feel so inadequate to be your pastor. I feel so inadequate to be a pastor. I'm not, I'm not good at it. I'm really not. I'm not even a good boss to my employees or to the volunteers. I, I, I see my inadequacies and all the ways I fall short. I don't deserve to be standing here. Any success or any good you see in me, it's really God that's using me. So my prayer for you is that you would continue to take those steps with whatever that means and trust God, he can use you. So I want you to bow your heads right now. Just wherever you are, bow your heads, close your eyes and ask. Jesus, what is that one step that you are asking of me? And listen. Ask God to command you to step out. Because he provides for us all the time. And he comes through for us all the time. And instead of being consumed with the wind and the waves, say, Lord, I would rather step out 
and walk on water. Because that would be amazing. And so once more today, we pray, every last one of us, including myself, that we would take a step out of the boat, a bold step, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And then when he does the impossible, we'd worship him. Lord, thank you. In every way, thank you for every way you've come through for us, every way you've rescued us, every way you've pulled us up out of the water, for every way you've given us bread and fish, for every way you've taught us, for every way you've provided for us. Lord, we have never thanked you enough, and we have never worshipped you enough. And we can say that boldly and honestly for everyone in this room. We haven't done it enough. Not for what you've done. Not for what you've done for each one of us. You have given so much of yourself, so much of your time for each one of us. Lord, if there's a way that you want us to step out of the boat, command us. We can do amazing things. We can do great and powerful things through you in whatever way that you are calling us to serve, to be your hands and feet in this world, Lord. Command us to come to you. Give us the reassurances that it is safe out there on the water with you. And once we join you, we will see in your provision and we will see your sufficiency like we always do. But most importantly, we will see your will. And that's where we'd rather be, in your will, more than anywhere else. In the struggle that I daily face with my will and what I want done, Lord, I pray that your will would win every time. There is a short time left. Seven million people in Texas Give us the heart for our neighbor and the stranger. Give us your heart. We are the church. We are your church. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for coming out and being with us. Of course, I would remind you that we are here. We are here and we would love to have you with us. We would love to have you sitting right here with us so we could shake your hand, smile, give you a hug, welcome you. Uh, We have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30, and that's our traditional service. We have a choir, and we're going to sing all of your favorite hymns. We have an 11 o'clock service, and in that service, we have a more contemporary worship style. You can come casual. Please wear jeans. uh, Wear whatever you'd like. We would love to have you. In between those two services, we have coffee and donuts. So if you like coffee and donuts, that's the time to come and have some fellowship. Uh, Also, during the 11 o'clock hour, we have an adult Sunday school class. So you can get into a group with some other adults in a smaller setting and go through the Bible together. We also have a full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And we have youth group every single Wednesday. That's right. We have Wednesday youth group, not just for our church, but for every kid in this community. So even if you do not attend our church and your youth group is far away and you don't have the time, you know, you can send your kid over on their skateboard or their bike. Trust me, they will meet some kids here they they already know probably and go to school with. Send them over at six o'clock. We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We'd love to be your church, but most importantly, we want to be the church where you live. If there's anything you need from us, if there's any way we can make your stay or more uh, enjoyable, please let us know. We would love to serve you. I'll see you guys next week.